Welcome to another life-changing episode of Phases of Resilience. This is your host, Furley Almonte. In this show, we spotlight extraordinary individuals who have very incredibly inspiring stories of resilience. And uh, today, I, I'm deeply excited to actually share with you a guest who has more than inspiring, but more like trailblazing story of resilience. You know, in life, there are things we can control and cannot control. We cannot control the families we were born to. And of course, we have the power to change the trajectory of our future. My guest today, Frank Song, actually was born to poverty and very dysfunctional environment. How he actually turned it around and create an iconic brand and become massively successful in the finance world will blow you away. Wait, let me share with you his bio first. Frank Song has done everything from excelling at one of the world's top private F equity firms that as of today has raised over $10 billion to running his own investment management company with more than $20 million in committed capital to pursue buyouts of businesses in diverse markets. Mr. Song has contributed to capital companies like Zinc Ahead that sold for $130 million. High Jump that sold for $750 million, and PageUp that sold for an undisclosed amount. In addition, Frank has close to 400,000 followers on Instagram. I'm one of them. <laughs> and has been a strategic resource for numerous politicians, celebrities, high net worth individuals, and has recently been featured in Forbes in an article titled, From Walmart to Wall Street, spotlighting his eight-figure journey. Wow, wow, wow. Welcome to Faces of Resilience, Frank. Thanks for having me on. I'm happy to be here as well. Oh my goodness. I'm reading your bio and I say, oh my goodness, how, how does a kid with a very dysfunctional environment turn things around? I am wondering, okay, as a kid, what was going through your mind as you witness your family, as you witness all the dysfunction that is going around you? What, walk us through that time. What do you remember? Uh, whew, that was, uh, I remember too much in very, very various ways. I would say the first thing that's really hard about being a child in that kind of environment is that, um, you know, this was obviously before the time of the internet and, uh, you know, uh, smartphones and things of that sort. So not like I lived in a desert or something. Obviously we had a TV, but, you know, TV shows at the time, I promise there's a point to this, were more like very like early 2000s, 90s, like, uh, uh, like Wonder Years type TV shows like Brady Bunch, things. Like that. So, you know, it's scripted, you know, it's fake, but you don't really know like what's real. Right. And so when you grow up in a dysfunctional family, I think I think the one thing I didn't understand was what was what was normal and what was not normal. I think mm -hmm. that's the biggest, most difficult part in living in one, that time period, and two, in that situation. So, you know, it, I couldn't just go onto YouTube. There was no YouTube during that time to, to see, like, uh, and I think it's really great that technology is expanding like this, that people all over the world can learn about different mental health issues. They can learn about uh, different, people can share different stories about their own households and understand, like, what's normal, what's not normal. So I would say during that time, I was, um, it felt normal. It, 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 it was kind of a weird you know, I, I would characterize the one word of my childhood as the word conflicting. Like it's it's kind of like it's hard to put in just like a box of good or bad. It's hard to put in like uh, a box of like happy or sad, it, it, you know, and, and part of it is like uh, there were good moments and bad moments. And it was it was hard to really think about it all. So I would say, you know, the biggest the biggest memory that I have uh, that I distinctly remember is that, <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't want to get too much into the detail, but. You know, there was a lot of uh, drinking in my household, uh, stress from money, you know, when you have financial issues, which is why I pursued, you know, going to Wall Street, because I realized how much money affects home life and stress and relationships. And uh, and I remember, uh, <laughs> sounds funny, like a prisoner, I had like a calendar, you know, a physical calendar, and I was checking off the days that... Um, my parents didn't have an explosive argument. I right, checked the days that my parents had an explosive argument. I mean, like when they fight, it's like, 
I mean, I could have been really rich if we had a camera in my house and we streamed it for, uh, you know, mixed martial arts boxing. I, I could have really made a lot of money from pay-per-view. Like, you know, it was really like Mike Tyson versus, you know, some. I, I, I really, really regret not to. Uh, <laughs> taking advantage of you know i try to and also if you see my 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 styles like you know you, you have to it's in the past and you have to be more uh, lighthearted about things if you carry it with such a depressing uh, feeling it doesn't work so yeah i would cross off the days that uh, they would fight and it. it was actually almost every day because you know you start losing your mind like you start especially as a child you know you're just like am, am i going crazy like it feels like this is a never ending fight. And then, so I, I literally was checking it off and I said, no, it's like 20 out of 30 days. So How many siblings did you have? Uh, one sister, one sister. And she's about uh, nine, 10 years younger than me. Okay. Did you feel the need to protect her from that environment at that time? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think, uh, First of all, I was very involved with uh, taking care of my sister when she was born, um, mostly because, uh, you know, my, my I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to explain the uh, the parts that are relevant to the background, like getting sidetracked. You know, my dad was an entrepreneur um, and he was working like 80, 90, 100 hour works a week to try to save his business as every, you know, he's stressed out. My mom is trying to help him. She, due to her mental sicknesses, she can't really work in like a normal company because she would probably have problems with her colleagues. If you know what I mean, her interpersonal relationships are pretty difficult for her to have, which uh, and I don't know why my father felt it was like a good idea for them. I think it just felt like the closeness of it. I think it's every person's dream that they can have some partnership and birth partnership. But anyways, it, it was uh, it was very hard. So the, obviously they're very tired from work. They're very tired from fighting. Fighting is also like a very exhausting activity and stuff. Uh, they, they didn't neglect my sister. They, they weren't bad parents, but like, obviously I stepped up. Like, I don't want to characterize them. Like, you know, my sister was a, in a dilapidated like room, like uh, without food or something. No, I, I, I don't want to stretch the truth. Like they, they were good in that they, they met their responsibilities, but obviously I, I stepped up, you know, when she was a baby, I held her, helped her not cry, fed her, changed her diapers a little bit. So yeah, I, I was involved. Um, I would say I was, I was, you know, with a 10 year age gap when, when, when she was like born, I, I was a bit young, so I just could take care of her. So I, I don't know if protect is the right word. They never involved her. She was never like, actually, if I really think about it, I don't really remember my sister very much in that time period. Cause she didn't really do anything. She just was like a baby, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, when she was about in third grade or fourth grade, they moved to Thailand. Uh, because my dad decided to start a business over there because it was uh, less competitive for him to try to earn money there than it would be in the United States. So I, 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 I felt this need, but then it wasn't, uh, you know, when, when I was around her, I was a little bit of a younger age. And obviously when she left, uh, there's not much I could have done. Yeah. But let, let me go back to when you were saying that you were crossing off the days that you were not fighting, right? Yeah. It's like a prisoner. So how did you plan your escape? Uh... I think uh, I think the word plan was <laughs> is a little bit too generous. I don't think, yeah, you know, I, I see the I see the uh, analogy, but you know, uh, I, I'll, I'll answer that. And I'll answer it in a little bit longer way because I think it's a very important point. You know, when when I started to become, you know, living on the streets and stuff like that, you know, I I didn't have very much support from my extended family. In fact, I uh, I received kind of very unpleasant views from them, which is like, oh, you know, you're just a young teenager who just wants to hang out with his friends. That's why you don't want to go home and blah, blah, blah. And it was hurtful for one, because obviously your family is like supposed to help you when you when you got some problems. But, you know, um, my family takes the approach of and I think it's a, a lot of families take this approach, especially from uh, different ethnic backgrounds is like, you know, you, you don't get into other people's personal lives or personal matters, right? And that's the stance my family took. And, you know, what I will say is that I don't think I can speak for myself and I'm pretty sure about this guy speak to a lot of people in this position. No child wants to pee out of their home, right? Like, so when I hear that a child is outside of their home, I don't hear that he wants to go or she wants to go hang out or have fun. I, I the, what registers in my mind is like, wow, that home life is so terrible that that option is even on the table, right? And so 
uh, yeah, I didn't plan it. It was like, you know, it became a breaking point. It was an emotional thing, uh, believe it or not, where I, I just, it was in the middle of a, a big fight, which I mean, they're all big fights. So it's hard to call them big fights because they're all really crazy, they're very physical, very like things being thrown. You know, my whole house had holes in the walls. Like it was, it was just too much. And then I think I was like four, 14 and I just, uh, I just uh, walked out that door and it kind of was the epiphany that changed your life that you can kind of change your situation, you know? Um, it, and yeah, it's, it's, it's not something that I think anybody wants to do. Um, so planning is a, is a, <laughs> and I think, especially when it comes to family, everyone tries to make it work out, you know, like you have too much hope. Mm. Which is not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. <laughs> Which is not a bad thing. But when did you reach that kind, that level of awareness that you need to do something to change your environment? I think, I think the most pivotal, I would say, the kind of catharsis moment really happened when, uh, and I vividly remember this moment really well, is it was when I was in Walmart and it was kind of like, a, it was kind of like a low point. So, you know, I think it happened around like, 16 so the first time i didn't have a place to go was was really 14 and then you know starting from 14 it kind of got worse and worse and worse because in the beginning you know i kind of called up some friends you know they kind of made up some bs excuse to their parents like you know oh frank is spending the night but it was really hard because um you know, I, I don't know what I'll say when I'm a parent, but, you know, it, it's just kind of weird. Like, you know, you can't be like, oh, yeah, can one of my friends sleep over on a school night? OK, that's already weird enough. Number one. Then they say, OK, why? And it's like, uh, well, he's homeless. Right. Like or he has, so people get scared. You know, and I don't I don't I don't have any ill wills to, to people because I understand, you know, they're like, especially in the United States. Is there some legal consequence that I might face by his parents? I never met his parents. I'm taking in a minor. Maybe it's kidnapping charge. You know, it's America. So it, it's not like they can not. And I don't think everyone was purely. Of course, there's some people who are just like, well, it's not my problem. So like, you know, there's everyone like that in the world. But I think for the most part, everyone was just concerned. And of course, there's it's just anything in life. There are a few people who are like, OK, we'll help out as, as much as we can. And once I exhausted that, then it kind of got lower, 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 bus stops, jack in the boxes, sleeping there. And then when I got to Walmart, it was like, it's been like, I, uh, I think it was like two years on and off of just this kind of like lifestyle. And it was uh, too much. And so I remember, you know, laying, uh, laying on the floor of Walmart, which is probably the worst thing you could probably ever feel like, you know, it's, it's like, um, uh, it's, it, 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 it's an interesting feeling and thought, if you want to get philosophical about this, that if you ask almost every person that you know, they never, they never put their, they never sat on the floor before in the public place. It's kind of weird, right? You never, I don't know very many people who sat on a sidewalk in San Francisco, like a dirty sidewalk, right? And it's kind of like this, like really interesting philosophical moment when I started really getting deeper into this kind of thought, which is like, huh, I went from, you know, normal house to I'm sitting in this case, laying, you know, and I, I'll describe it because, you know, you start to feel weird about it. Like your hair is touching the ground. Like, you know, it's it wasn't like it was like mud or something, but you, it was less about the emotional impact of it. It was just more like it was dirty, you know, and you're just like, how did I end up here? And then, you know, it really made me understand two things. One, how fragile, you know, the safety net really is. Right. That's why I became so obsessed with uh, understanding finance. I went to uh, 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 Wall Street. I was uh I have always huge safety nets and financially, I always uh, do everything conservatively. I always do things. Pro I think it very much influenced how I do business today. I, I do everything like old school. I'm not a uh, momentum swing crypto trader. I do everything like you have a good service, you do this. So it, it really influenced me like that, number one. And number two, uh, the kind of eye-opening moment was uh, when I I was laying there and I, you know, as a child, you're always wondering and waiting for some parent some adult to help you that's the point of being a child right like either a teacher or something and you know I was like it's been two years nobody's coming you know and and I really remember like wiping my tears and because you're just like you know you start you start to really questioning everything in life uh you know like is there a god if there is a god why is god doing this to me why me why this you know like you start getting super philosophical when you're at a huge low point um and you start really thinking about things and you know, uh, we'll leave those topics for now. But the one at, at least conclusion I was able to come up with, which is which is like, well, clearly nobody has solved this problem in two years. So 
I guess I'm alone here and I will solve this problem myself. And so from that moment, Hold explore. for a second, just for a moment. So why are your parents not looking for you then? Uh, you know, it's it was so complicated. Like in the beginning, they were looking. It's not, you know, they were looking. So on one sense, in the beginning, I, in the beginning, they were looking because obviously they were concerned, right? Uh, they, they, they're, they're kind of normal parents with, with just like really serious personal demons, if that, if I can characterize. So they weren't like horrible people. Um, they were just exhausted and fighting each other and uh, getting me and my, me involved particularly. And so, uh, in one sense, I will be honest, like I didn't want to be found, right? Like I didn't mm -hmm. want to go back. That was the reason I left It's <laughs> that I don't want to go there. So in, in one sense, they were trying to look for me, but, uh, that was the point of, kind of hiding, I guess you can call it that, like, I didn't want to go back. And second, you know, I think they, uh, you know, and as I got older, I appreciate this more, but you know, they, my, my dad had huge financial problems, work problems, like health problems. So it's kind of like, he also had to pick his battle. So I, in one sense, I do feel somewhat of a burden, I guess, guilt for putting him through that. But at the same time, like it was my least worst option. Like I, I, what do I, you know, and it was my default option. We all drowned together. At least like somebody must survive. Right. Because clearly they weren't changing their, their life circumstance and their behavior. So, I mean, are we all going to drown together? So how, how did you feed yourself? How were you able to, you know, have a roof over your head? You're like, I'm thinking, okay, you're 16, you're living in the street. Like, where do you get money for food? And Oh, and God, you want the details. Okay. I'm, just, so, I'm, I'm sure that there are some people who may be, you know, asking these questions. They're listening right now. It's like, yeah, that's a good question. How did he be able to support himself? How, what did, what did he do in, um, in Walmart? Uh, wouldn't yeah. they kick him out in um, if they uh, didn't you smell? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I know it's a legit question, right? Like if you if you don't have a home and you can't you know take care of things like we would normally do as human beings, like you know, I'm sure there's a lot of questions people are asking because like you know because your your journey to turning things around is really very very fascinating and very inspiring. But when you picture those low moments and those people who are listening right now, imagining themselves in different, you know, I, I guess in different circumstances of low. Mm -hmm. In yours, it's like the homelessness and, you know, like, you know, it's, you know, looking to change your, your life. Walk us through your time in Walmart and how, you know, you were able to start changing things around from you being there. I cannot even imagine you being able to stay in Walmart without getting kicked by security. That's, an, that's <laughs> another. So uh, you asked. <laughs> I would say each question you asked. If this was a like a TV show, each is its own episode. So I will try <laughs> to answer it as, as quickly as possible. But <clears throat> uh, as a preamble to answering all this uh, nitty gritty questions, I always love to to find lessons and things, right? And when I was uh, doing all this stuff, like in Walmart, and I'll answer your question directly. It's actually, I actually use it as a business case study a lot of times, th these, these times. I actually use it as a, as a roadmap for my business today, I, I, which is, you know, when, when, I first, when I first had these situations, especially as a young adult and, um, and a young and an older teenager, I really felt like I was like unlucky, like, uh, like I had some like uh, disadvantage, I would say is a better word, right? And what became really interesting is that when I started doing my own thing and I started working on Wall Street and I was competing against, you know, like other really very talented people, very smart, very hardworking, like, you know, Wall Street only accepts like all the super people, you know, it's like um, it's like the Navy SEALs. Like you, can, you, you don't go to Navy SEALs just because you're big and strong. You're big, strong, you're smart. You uh, are a team player. Like, so I was with like really all really great people and I could see a lot of their strengths from their traditional backgrounds and what started becoming a shining light for me especially when i started my own doing my own stuff was that all the experiences that i had during this time period became my strategic advantage that i could be so resourceful that mm -hmm. i could look at a situation and calmly be like well okay there are missiles falling from the sky there's a bomb going off over there well uh 
Okay, let's do step one, step two, step three. Like, you know, so it's something simple as that. And 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 two, just the resourcefulness, like because every day you're you're trying to make something happen. And, you know, I guess I just exercise that side of my brain so much that like even now when I'm in my team meetings and I'm looking for salute people, my managers and team members are always like, you come up with the answer so fast. And it's like it's always like <laughs> you know, I think it's from this training. So uh, the question about Walmart, how did I not get kicked out? I think that's the most interesting one and the, the most thoughtful one. Uh, the other stuff is just like just things I had to come up with and things. Obviously, I didn't have to. I didn't do the most proud stuff I could possibly do. You, you know, you're homeless. So it's not like I I uh, was doing people's tax returns or something. But I can share a little bit of some stuff I was doing with the Walmart thing. Yeah, like that was that was a huge decision because, you know, obviously I ran out of kind of like favors and things of that sort. Uh, the bus stop. <laughs> I slept there a few times. It was it was pretty dangerous. I, I would say that's probably the of all the options, probably the least. That's probably the most risky option, the most dangerous option. I even had like a hierarchy of like places to sleep in my <laughs> uh, Jack in the box. Believe it or not, you know, if you see homeless people in a fast food store slumped over like this, believe it or not, that is the most comfortable position of all homeless sleeping positions, mm -hmm. actually, because the floor is like really, really uh, painful. Right. So if you're like sleeping on the ground. Is really hurtful. So whatever they did to design that table and that chair, if you're slumped over like this sleeping, like it's actually very good proportions where it's it's actually relatively comfortable. But that's probably the worst. That, so the comfortability level is very high. High, you know, <laughs> high. <laughs> I'm not saying it's like a Tempur-Pedic or something and everyone should go do this, but, you know, it was the, be the best, the worst option. Um, but the 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 it also with everything in life had the core corollary uh, a negative a big negative which is it's very easy to get kicked out of there because it's so blatantly like in your face right and it really deters customers and so you know people it is it, just really hard to like consistently get that kind of spot depending on the person so then I came up with the idea of Walmart because I said well you know what's open twenty four seven right there's only so many places in there okay that that, that limited to a couple of places. Okay. Walmart started becoming a little bit more of attractive options. I said, okay, but it's big. All Walmarts are at least huge. Right. So worst case, at least I can try to find some way to hide. Like, you know, Walmart employees are not like the TSA at the airport. They're not constantly searching for a homeless kid. So, you know, it's midnight. So I don't think they're the most motivated people on earth to like, you know, I, this is just my logic, you know, to, to hunt me down. I think they have, I think they're, they're just chilling, you know? Um, <clears throat> So that's why I started to go, okay, I think this Walmart thing's a little, a little better. And at least the security cameras, nobody really thinks of this idea. So it's a little safer, you know, so I try to do Walmart. Uh, the first, the first while was, was pretty good because, you know, I, I slept in like, uh, different areas and stuff like that, like uh, changing rooms and things like that. But that's also a little bit dangerous because they can dangerous, not like for your physical safety, but they can catch you. Um, you know, you just try to like find little pockets to hide. And I think a few times I slept, I can't remember Walmart, another store. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember anymore. It's such a long time. But I slept in a tent. You know, they have the tent displays and you just go in there. <laughs> like, yeah, it's also a little bit oh like uh, sometimes they can see it. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. It's obviously very, very fascinating. Just like what, I need a series. I need a show series just to feature you, just like what you said. Because, you know, by it's the great. way, you can actually make a lot of money doing a reality show. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, as, as much as as much as it's a show, it was it was ridiculously all true. It was crazy. And then so to answer your question about the man, uh, about what happened, um, you know, eventually I started coming more and more often and I kind of have the same clothes. So obviously people are not that stupid. Right. They're kind of like, OK, this this kid can't possibly need tomatoes every day. Right. Like, why is this guy coming like near midnight, like in near the same clothes and like. So, yeah, then I started having some problems getting kicked out. <clears throat> and this is where I started really understanding the power of, like, people and relationships and uh, and networks and things like that. So there was, like, a – I don't know what to call this position, like, head manager, general manager of the store, something, something, something. And, you know, I just – I just uh, – uh, part of me was, like, okay, I'll just listen to the rules and leave. And then, you know, part of me, I, I, I guess it was such a desperate situation. I said, you know what? what do I lose by just talking to him, telling him my situation, just being direct. And that was also a learning lesson why I was able to break into Wall Street because they don't they it was it was very hard for me to compete into it because they like people, uh, 
you know, who don't ha usually have these problems. Again, it became like much better because like, obviously because uh, my work ethic was really high. They were like, okay, we, we like this guy, but originally it was very hard to break in. Okay. So but, you know, stop, stop there no. for a moment because I would like to, okay. From, so here you are now like uh, in, in, in um, Walmart and now just give us like a short version of what it would, what did you do to start getting into, you know, um, to school to be able to learn, you know, all of that, because it's very, you know, it's, I'm, I'm sure it's, people are very intrigued of how that journey of you, um, you know, achieving education in finance and being able to become the iconic business person that you are. It's a, it, you're actually an, a business icon now. Okay, so thank you. That's, that's a word okay. I never, I never associated myself with, but you know, but thank you. You so are, much. you are. I'm mean, like, it's, trailblazing you know i'm listening to you and i hear resourcefulness so many people don't tap into resources and that you talk about networking these are all business lessons right yeah. that you learned the hard way but in yeah. a very very profound way so how did you get to school and become and start the process of you becoming a wall street icon so going to uh school was tough as you can imagine um the honest truth is i i i took all the hardest classes i was in all the ap class and all the honors class so i took the hardest curriculum load possible my grades were not so good it wasn't like a, a lack of interest in learning the, the problem with school is obviously a large percentage of your grade involves participation and attendance and especially in like the ap classes right discussion counts for a lot so my grades were pretty pretty darn bad <laughs> Um, I was studying in Jack in the Box for the SAT, and it was really my only hope because if you have a low SAT score, you have a low GPA. And first of all, if you don't go to a good university, it doesn't Wall Street, it would be almost nearly impossible. And it was already nearly impossible if you go to like a good university and not the best. And if you don't go to any university or a very, a very uh, low targeted one, it'll be almost nearly impossible. So I knew that if I wanted to make it into Wall Street and change a better life, it was like, you know, I had to complete. You ever watch the movie Gravity? No, not yet. With Sandra Bullock, the one she's in space. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, yes. Gravity, yeah. <clears throat> I felt like the best way to describe my life is like is like that movie, which is, you know, she has one immediate problem. You solve that one to solve that problem to get to the next one. And, you, and eventually she makes it to Earth, right? Mm -hmm. My situation is kind of like that, which is, okay, I want to make it to Wall Street, but then I need to be able to get a good university. If I want to get a good university, I need to, you know, get there. So I studied for the SAT really hard while being homeless. Uh, I studied in the Jack of the Box most. Uh, I went. I studied in the library. Then after when the library closed for school, you you go to the Jack of the Box, and um, and I scored almost a perfect score. So that was helpful. Yeah. So you know, I wasn't like dumb. I, and that's why the GPA made me look like you know, uh, you know like not like not capable of their university. That's why I really understood that like, at least this is designed where I can take one test. It doesn't involve participation, it doesn't involve consistency because when you don't have a consistent home or place to do your homework, you can't really do your homework, right? So I said, okay, I really, really have to smash this out of the park. I did. And it was still 50-50 because as a missions officer, look at this, we're like, well, this is kind of a weird situation. His GPA is so low, like it's so bad low, but his uh, SAT is like near the highest. So then I wrote uh, again, like uh, it was through that period of Walmart that I, I I usually don't open up very much. And, you know, I find that I keep everything to myself. But in my admissions essay, I kind of I kind of explain not like even explain. I, I put them in a day of life in my situation. And lo and behold, they, you know, they, they helped me with that. And uh, I ended up getting into a pretty decent university. And then uh, in university it was the new fight, which is how to make it to Wall Street. Right. OK, I'm in university. I mean, there is a statistic I read. Um, it's something like this. It's from the Financial Times or something. I haven't looked in a long time, but I had the uh, team member had to pull it because they were writing some kind of press stuff about investment banking. And I think Morgan Stanley, JP, don't quote me on this, but like uh, in the articles, like only two percent of people who apply for investment banking positions are accepted, and it's 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 something really a low num number. And when I was accepted to the private equity firm. Uh, they told me that I interviewed against 500 people. So like these, these numbers are astronomically low and just being smart or good is not enough because they have so few spots and they have uh, space. So like just going up to them, like in a movie, like, Oh, I can make you some money. They're like, well, we're already super rich. You know, like that's number one, number two, like we have a full line of you guys, like 
for girls, you know? So it's, it's not like in the movies where you just show that you're, you really, really have to really like, it's, it's, it's something, I don't know. Maybe I was nuts at the time. I don't know how I thought it was a good idea to get in. Like, like, I was gonna say like how how did you you know how did you stand out? You know, yeah. the more that I described it, I realized this was a crazy you know goal. Like, why did I think this was a good idea? You know, but actually, speaking of that, that that and let me level set to make the story even more ridiculous. Okay, when I started searching was in oh I started at university in 06, 07. 08, right? What was happening during this time? The financial crisis. So not only was I going for a crazy goal, I was going to the I was going to the storm of the greatest, you know, a recession uh, known to man since the Great Depression in the exact industry where they were laying people off. So I must have been. I don't know what was going on. I think stubbornness there, is a little bit. There is industry. a god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it was something crazy, and I I had this one motto. I had this one motto, and I think. I don't know if this will help people on this show. It helped me during really dark times and almost everything is like, you know, okay, the world's coming to an end. There's all these financial crises. People are getting laid off. That's a big world. There has to be one company that's hiring even during the situation. And I will be that person, right? You don't have to, I don't need 10 job offers. I just need one. And I emailed every managing director. I even still have the old, the outlook.pst files and the Excel spreadsheet. I emailed almost every managing director in every continent except for Antarctica for that, for those internships to break in. Um, and my, my, my philosophy was just like, I just need to be, I just need one. That's it. Right. Same thing with uh, relationships, right? To have a happy marriage, you don't have to have like 10 wives, right? You just need one, you know, one, you just need to be right once, right? Like, <laughs> It's, you, you kind of see my point, like it, 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 you can apply it to everything, right? To be successful in business, you, you know, and they, this is the, the, the overused example, but it's true. Like, you know, you can fail nine times and then the one time. So you can use, I, that's the most common way it's, it's, it's uh, usually used, but it applies to everything, right? So I'll try to leave oh it. My right goodness. There. And so from that internship, like how did you skyrocket to becoming, you know, the, what the person that I read about in your bio? Oh, so the, I would say most of my learning lessons and character development happened during my, during my, my teenage years for obvious reasons. So when I came to wall street, I wouldn't say it shaped my character in any different way or like I, or something, but I would say that um, during my time there, I really, I really started to understand that uh, the world is much more, much more similar in every kind of facet than you can imagine, right? There's like, I, I remember Barack Obama said this really funny thing and it resonated with me and I, I can't quote it exactly, but it was along the lines of like, you know, when I was a community organizer, you know, there was like one guy he works with that's like really dumb and one guy who's a little clueless, one guy who's super passionate and like one guy, and I think he said it's like some kind of speech and he's like, and Barack Obama's main point was that he told a really funny story. He's like, then when I became, uh, you know, his, uh, I don't remember, like senator or something or in Congress, he said like, there's the same types of people that you got that one dumb congressman, you got one that really cares about the issues and doesn't really care about the politics. And then he, then he makes the funny joke is that I became president and there's the same groups of people. Right. And, you know, uh, I think the most interesting thing is that when I would, you know, when, when you look up to wall street a lot, yes, there are a lot of talented people and I stand by everything I say about a lot of my colleagues and a lot of the people that I learned from for sure. But obviously <laughs> it wasn't every single person. Right. And you, you see people's different uh, routes of how they got there. Some got there with connections. Some got there because their parents are clients and own very big tech companies. And you see some, some there, were, there were also some people, not just some, there were many, many, many normal people like myself who they came from small backgrounds. Uh, the only difference is that like they were, they, they, they came maybe from small towns or from, from some, some bad situation, but they worked really hard in school and they weren't homeless. So then they were able to get to Ivy league school. So I, I didn't have that route, but uh, they, they did work hard in that sense. So that's how they got it. And, you know, you just, um, it, it shaped me in that, you know, I realized that um, everything is possible, you know, it, it's very doable. And when you do this work, you realize that most of the work on earth is not, genius level work you know you just 
use some logic, use some thoughtfulness and put some effort into it. And I mean, you can almost solve any problem. Yeah. What, what was your biggest break that got you to where you are now? Uh, in business or on Wall Street? Business. What I do now, okay, in business. Uh, <coughs> the biggest breakthrough, like learning lesson breakthrough, would you say? No, biggest break. Like, you know, who opened, who helped you, you know, and position oh. you, you know? Or was it was it a series of like? Good yeah, I, I wouldn't say that I had like some kind of like, you know, spike moment where it was like, um, all of a sudden something started clicking and that, and that's, that's, I think that's why I take such a conservative approach because ever since I was about 18, I was uh, doing my own business when I was 18 to pay for, I paid for university myself, forgot to mention that. So when I was 17, I was working at a real estate company, telemarketing. When I was 18, I got my real estate license in California. When I was 19, I got my series seven stockbroker license. When I was also 19. I got my life and discipline insurance. So I, was, I was very much working. And I will say that, <coughs> So, you know, when, when you look at what I'm doing here, it's uh, and it, I know they have like uh, Instagram memes about this and not just memes, but like inspirational stuff. But it's really true. Like, you know, what what you're seeing happening now is not a recent thing. I've been I've been studying uh, the science of money and and improving myself steadily for 15 years. Right. So all that wealth was and, you know, I got into Wall Street for a very specific reason, actually. I, I knew originally I thought I was going to become a managing director and move on up. But I knew it was a good career because at, at the worst point, I knew it was the exact lessons I need to learn to take with me because these are people who understand math and money and, you know, how to multiply it and how to uh, expand it. Right. So I was like, OK, well, this makes the most sense. And I built a lot of very great skills like financial modeling, valuation modeling, being able to just take some numbers, put in Excel and, and analyze it. And so. You know, every single year was just consistent building. It was like, you know, I remember when I was a teenager, I had overdraft fees. Can you believe that? I had overdraft fees, like almost like hundreds of dollars, hundred dollars per month. Like, you know, it was bad situation. So I think I came from the lowest that you can possibly come. I took one dollar, one dollar turned into two, turned two into four, four into 16, 16 into 32, 32 into 64. And you just, I, I did that for 15 years, you know? And so, uh, and uh, you know, I, 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 I would uh, I would be uh, I had lots of good people who've helped me in my life for sure. Uh, I, I joke with this and I said it in another interview, which is I say there's no such thing as a self-made man, right? Because I don't know one person who's a multimillionaire or worth hundred million above or a billionaire who doesn't have a team that hasn't had people who've given a break. So that you, this I, I know I'm playing with words here, but uh, the concept for me is very important that there's no such thing as a self-made. Like you didn't do it literally by yourself. So I had good people. But I, would, I wouldn't say that I had some like mentor who taught me some kind of special trick or formula and all of a sudden things started working. Um, I wouldn't uh, – and I wouldn't say I had some explosion <laughs> in, in wealth. And I think that's why I, I have 200 team members across the world, and I think that's why they like working with me. I have very, very low attrition. When people work for me, they don't quit. Um, and, and the reason is because, you know, we're consistent. I do everything properly properly. It's maybe the long way, as you can see, it's very long, but uh, we do everything correctly. You, you are basically a lifetime, you know, masterpiece in progress. Like, and, you know, the fact that you have continuously improved yourself a lot. I am I, I, in awe of how, you know, how aware you are in personal growth and how you have the power to actually change your destiny. I noticed you, you you were coughing just a little bit during this interview, and I know that we rescheduled so many times this interview, <laughs> right? Because yeah. you were not feeling well. Yeah. And I would love to know, you know, if you don't mind sharing, what yeah, you sure. learned from this uh, experience that you've had recently, and how does it apply to your life and your business? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yeah, about a month ago, I got COVID, uh, and the the cough, thank God, is not from COVID anymore. I'm fully over it. It's, it's the the air is dry in the winter time, and it makes my throat hurt. Um, <coughs> but yeah, that COVID was no joke. <laughs> it was it was it was really no joke. I, I uh, not to say I was joking about it before, but it was my first first bout with COVID. Of course, I understand the statistics of it and I read the news. So it wasn't like I was um, taking it lightly. But, you know, I had never – one fortunate thing about my life is I, I don't have any allergies, real allergies. I don't have any – never grew up in any disease. I, I never been like 
sick. I never even stayed a night in the hospital, never broke a bone. Um, so for the most part, I've been very fortunate in that regard that my health is very good. I think the last time I had the flu that was very serious was maybe like 17 years ago. Like I, I, and, and that was only like, you know, like I was hot and shivering and a little bit in pain anyways. So when the Corona thing started happening, like, uh, the first few days I was like, yeah, okay. It's not so bad. Okay. You know, I'm surviving. Okay. I just need some pain pills. And the moment actually is a little bit of a funny moment. The moment I, I realized I had Corona was, you know, when I'm sick, I like to eat a little bit of junk food and usually I, I don't eat it too often. So I got McDonald's and I usually never go to McDonald's. So I was eating McDonald's and I was talking on the phone with somebody and somebody happened to just say like, just asking me how I was doing. It's just like, Oh, you know, how's your McDonald's? And I'm like, I don't know. Wait a minute. And I started eating it more. I said, wait a minute. I can't taste it. And oh my God. Okay. That's a good question. I didn't, even, and I didn't know how long, cause I, I, I don't really pay attention to things so much. I'm, I'm always in my mind about like business and strategies that sometimes that's why I always lose my keys and stuff. Cause I'm always like, so I didn't really think about this concept. And then when they asked me, I said, Oh yeah, this, this is, this is Corona. This is what they described. And then after day six, it was like, it got really bad. And so I was like shivering all the time. It was like, it was just too hot, too cold. It was like the biggest pain. So what did I learn from that? Well, I had lots of time to just be practically dead. Like I was like sleeping like 16 hours per day without choice and drinking pain pills. So the first lesson I realized, I, I, I again, maybe I'm too philosophical with everything, but like, I really, really started thinking about my grandfather. And my grandfather is like in his 80s. I'm very fortunate that all my grandparents uh, just were alive. And I only had one grandfather die. And so everyone like pretty much lived to their 80s. And my grandparents in the late 80s. And, you know, I joke around my grandfather. My grandfather had a good relationship. He's actually very similar to me. Old school business owner. Like I, I learned some good philosophies from him, um, you know, like step by step, you know. And I'm when I was younger, I was like more like, go, 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 go. And he's like. You know, just do the best you can every day. And I said, no, that's for losers. Like, I will do twice as much. And he's just like, you know, you're, you're, you're a nutty little teenager who thinks he can like, and I said, I will do it. And, uh, and what I thought about was uh, his lessons, right? Which is one, just before I got COVID, I went to a specialist for my neck and my muscle. And I was like, doctor, I'm getting headaches. And for so many years, and I'm not a sick person. Like, what's the problem? And he checked my body. I said, do I need to go to the gym more? Day? And he checked my body and he said, your body is so tense. Like, this is like, you are not sick, like as like health wise, but your body's crying out in pain and it's causing you to have like a headache and you need to relax. And I said, I don't know how, like, you know, even <laughs> I don't have any hobbies, you know, I really love, I love my company. I love people. I love my work. I, that's why I can do it. It's not like I'm torturing myself. I'm not stressed out every day. Like I'm, I'm drudging myself to stuff. So it's like really hard. And I don't really have any like hobbies. Like, uh, I, I really don't. And traveling is like, you know, I'm not a big traveler. It's actually more inconvenient for me because I, I have to find the right restaurants that are good. And maybe it's good reviews, but it's fake. And like, you know, it's like, I, I like to <laughs> have consistency in life. So when I travel, it's actually more inconvenient for me because I'm so used to like knowing like, okay, this is a good restaurant. That's a bad restaurant. You know, I know, you know, the routines and stuff. So the first thing was like, uh, we were making this joke a little bit. And again, I always try to look at the positive and everything, but you asked me how I felt after COVID and I feel great. I feel way better than I ever felt in like three or four years because maybe it was God, it was destiny or whoever. But at that moment he put COVID or I got COVID as a statistical, like uh, mm. the way that works. And I was out like a light. There was no choice. It was literally like a coma. Like there, I couldn't, I couldn't move. I was so sick that I had to call my dog's pet hotel that I, that I keep in when I travel and they know my dog very well. They like it very much. The owner had to drive from the hotel to come to me because I couldn't take care of my dog anymore. I literally couldn't move. And I knew this was becoming dangerous because I care about my dog. So <clears throat> they literally came to my house, picked up my dog, said like, I hope you feel better. And then they took care of my dog. That's how bad I felt. And as I started to recover, all my muscles were so soft. Like it was a mm. you know, headache went away. Like it sounds really strange, but like it really taught me the importance of like just being knocked out for like three, four, five days. Like it did wonders for uh, 
again, it's, I'm not trying to make light of the serious illness, but I always try to at least look at the positives, right? Like, cause everything's so difficult in life. So just look at the So positives. it forced you to slow down. Whoa. In a, in a way where it's like, it was almost like, again, it could be random statisticalness or, but it came at the right moment where it really, so now I feel better than I felt in four years. I've been having this problem in four years. That's wonderful. Now, you know, like, Hopefully you also take a little bit more time for self-care now <laughs> and not have to wait for another incident to happen, right? Yeah, 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 for sure. Right, right. Okay, um, we're nearing the end of the show. Sure. What would you say is your biggest resilience life hack that you can share with our audience? Hmm. Biggest. Biggest is hard. So resilience, you mean you like... You. <laughs> Like p pushing through hard, something to think about when you push through hard times? Yeah, like, yeah, be because like, say, for example, you've been through so many of them and yet here you are, you know. Yeah. Um, so what would you say was the your biggest resilience life hack? Yeah, that's a good question. Oh, it's hard to say life hack, but I would say philosophy uh, okay. for me. Uh, I wish I had life hacks. I like life hacks a lot, but I, I'm not very good at coming up with life hacks, to be honest. <laughs> I love reading people's, I love clever things. So when I read people's clever life hacks, I go, wow, that's, that's really clever. I'm, I'm not, I'm not very good with life hacks. <laughs> so I will say philosophy wise, like when things get tough, you know, the one thing that always pushed me, especially when I was starting my business, it was very difficult. Like I, uh, there was one point that PG&E got shut off um, because I had spent so much money helping my parents because uh, my dad, you know, Let's not get to this part. His uh, aorta valve tour, he had like high risk surgery and blah, blah, blah. So like every American, you know, you're affected by uh, health bills. To, to it was my journey. And my drying machine wasn't working. And I was like hanging clothes like, uh, like, and anyways. And through all that time, when I was starting my business, when I was a teenager through trying to get to Wall Street, the one thing that kept pushing me, which is like, you know, I can either lose by default, or I can lose trying, right? Like, I just don't know why I always went back to that when it got really tough. I said, well, life is crap already. If you're not happy, it's already bad. So if you try, it'll just be bad again, or it can at least have an upside. So if you choose the default, the status quo, it's, it's a hundred percent bad. Like there's no, there's no probability. Right. And if you have any semblance of statistics and like, uh, and probability, like if I have the choice of like no ups, zero percent upside and a hundred percent downside versus like, you know, 80% downside, 20% upside, it's, I mean, like it's mathematical, like, you know, so I, I, I would say that that was the biggest thing. And, and the concept I told you about just one, just one, it seems it seems so crazy. Like, you know, I, I'll give one more example. You know, people say, oh, I don't know how to find money. I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that for my business. There, there's about like 5,200, uh, 2,500, uh, I think, known billionaires. Right. And if you contacted a billionaire a week, I'm pretty sure you'll you'll get somebody right. Like there's X amount of investment bankers in the world. And I emailed almost all of them and I just need one of them. Right. If you're looking for, you know, you're struggling with your relationship and you're trying to find the right partner, you know, and you're tired of dating and you went a lot of, have had a lot of relationship, past relationships or past, like, uh, you know, you know, you get burnt out from dating all the time. You know, you just need to be right once. Like, I, I really, I really believe in this concept. Just, just one time. And same thing with business, right? Of course, to a reasonable degree, like, don't do something crazy if the, if just for, uh, without thinking about it, but yeah, if, if, if you have your logic there and you see that there's some market for it and it, the times are tough, that's yeah, okay. Just keep going. Like, Just one. What a great title for a book. <laughs> <laughs> you just need one. It's really true. You, you, in most of the life, you just need one. Just one. David yeah. Fagan, if you're listening, <laughs> <laughs> here's another book. Just yeah. one. You know, it's amazing what you just shared. And I truly believe in that because... Oftentimes, I remember before when I was trying for something, right? I said, listen, if I go try for something that may be a little far-fetched, I have 50% chance that I will get in, mm -hmm. right? that I will get, get it, right? But if I don't, I have 100% guaranteed failure. Yeah, so sure. just like you, you know, like I will take that chance and I hope that 
all people were inspired by what you have just shared with us because there are so many different lessons that you shared in this interview alone the resourcefulness your principle of finding just one that one big you know connection that one big resource that one big you know um you know like ha life hack I am sure after this interview you could create a whole list of life hacks that you have learned from all of your days from your home <laughs> to where you are right now by the way I am very curious why Ukraine you are in Ukraine right now I am in Ukraine. It's a very good question. It was also a very analytical decision. Um, you know, uh, when I w my my, be my best friend uh, in school, when I was in high school, I spent, they were very kind people and they helped me a lot during this time as much as they possibly could. They were Ukrainians. Um, and as I was growing my business, I was thinking, you know, strategically art of warish, you know, another big concept. I know this is not the concept of today's talk, but I believe technology is very important. Like if you look at any war, technological advances is like a very important thing. Now, technology advances doesn't mean like uh, when you're in when you're in your business that it doesn't mean you have to invent something. It means understanding how to use uh, something more sophisticatedly, right? So, in my markets, I'm I'm in very unsexy markets where it's slow growth. So just just as simple as understanding how to copyright better than them and launching ads faster than them and understand the algorithm better than them and, you know, building some software tools that we can operate faster, more efficiently, more profitably. So with that being said, you know, um, I had already been hiring a lot of engineers from Ukraine. I can only speak very highly about this country and uh, the level of talent that they have here. It's ridiculous, the level of talent they have here in video, in photography, in programming, in events management, in um, in design. It's it's really, really like, you know, and I feel like a sense of a connection with them because it's kind of like the underdog, right? And they're just trying to make things happen. And you can see that spirit here. So it kind of kind of reminds me of how I remember uh, Silicon Valley being described in the 60s, 70s and 80s or something around that time period where it was just like everybody just trying to grind. And like there's always a new restaurant, new project, new this, new that that people are working on. And everyone's just just trying to do it. And so it made a lot of sense because I, I as I said, I hate fly. I, I don't, I'm not afraid of flying. It's just irritating to like do that. And so <laughs> from San Francisco to stop in Munich, that's like 10 hours. And then you have, you know, you two hours to be at the airport. Then you're two, two to six hours at Munich. Then you're like uh, another two hours over there. And I said, okay, this is, this is too much. I'll just live here. And so it's just easier to manage the technology team over here. Uh, th that's wonderful. Okay. Any last words before we go? No, thank you for having me on. And uh, I really enjoyed this session and uh, I hope this uh, helped somebody. Oh, it certainly will. Listen, you know, you have learned so many lessons from this. You know, you can see that life is all about choices. You cannot control certain things in life. You cannot control your family, where you were born, where you live, right? You know, often that, or where you were born to live, right? I didn't say that right. Actually, no, you have actually... Con controlled where you you are going to live what i'm saying is that you, you where you were born is yeah. entirely by accident where you're going to be in life how you decide to spend it and how you create a legacy basically is all up to you and all it takes is just one that's correct one choice one thing yep one thing frank what a blessing it is and i hope that you will continue to uh, prosper in life, inspire others, and also continue to live a, a beautiful, healthy life. And remember, slow down. And I will, <laughs> all it takes, by the way, remember, you don't have to have many wives, <laughs> many partners in life. All Just one, one can lead to a lifetime of happiness. Remember that, right? <laughs> Just oh, one. Wow. All right. See, that is a great like um, way to, to close. You know, all it takes is just one, one sure. pathway. And that is finding the right path for you. So on that note, you are not what happened to you. You are what you choose to become. This is your host, Furley Almonte, with my special guest, Frank Song from Ukraine. And um, please continue to, he has a book that's coming up very, very soon. And I can't wait to read those pages because I know that it will inspire so many people who are going through tough times in their lives. So that is one extraordinary story of resilience. And I hope that you were inspired as much as I was. Thank you so very much. Until next time, Happy this is Furley Almonte from Faces of Resilience. Take care. Bye-bye.